Madeline, Madeline Dell here, and I have an excellent author for you guys. I have both of these books right here. They are amazing, and I am going to let him introduce himself and tell us a little bit about himself and what he's got going on. So take it away, Joe. All right. Hi, I'm Joe Compton. I am the author of those amazing books that Madeline held up. They're crime thrillers. So one, the first one's called Amongst the Killing, and the second one's We the Moral Majority, and they follow the path of uh, some interesting characters uh, who are in law enforcement and uh, who one who is kind of a mass murderer and it's told in their perspective. So I write in their POVs and uh, uh, I've done film in the past. So I've worked on movies and, and, and made movies and, uh, and I currently run go Indy now, which is an online network that uh, supports and highlights and uh, fosters indie artists. And I have to admit, Go Indie Now is the best place to find some amazing author, guys. That's how I met Joe. And that's how I stumbled upon his amazing books. So, which I'll let you guys look at those. They are both super, super good. I honestly wanted to stay up reading, but my child did not let that happen. So, and... I, you are working on book three now. Is that what you told me the other day? Yeah, I just started. Yeah, I well, I I had I had a couple chapters worked out already, but uh, and I have a general idea of where it's going. I just uh, haven't had the time to sit down and write it. But uh, yeah, uh, your your review kind of inspired me to look at it again, and then when I started looking at it, I managed to write the entire prologue. So that's we're we're into it now so i'm ready to go we so how are you going to balance writing this book and everything else you've got going on uh it's a careful it's a careful tightrope that i walk i guess uh i just um i make time prioritize my time you know i make sure that if if i'm feeling like writing i go and write if i'm feeling like doing go and enough stuff i go and do go and enough stuff now Going to now stuff is a little bit more time sensitive and I have, you know, I have to get certain things out because it's not just me that depends on that. That's people who I've interviewed or talked to and, or I'm featuring or whatever, all that. So I tend to try and get as much of that done as possible first, but uh, it, I'm up a lot. I don't sleep uh, quite a bit. So, I mean, I, I do sleep, but I, you know, and I, and as I go get older, I sleep more and more, but, um, I have a routine kind of, and it just works and I find time. I, I, I usually, I'm a stream of consciousness writer. So if I'm writing, I'll go until I feel like the tank is emptied. So if I get into writing, I'm usually there for about two or three hours. So. That is awesome. I feel like as creatives, like it's a curse that we don't sleep well. Because <laughs> so, I've noticed as I've began to write more and become more involved in all the creative stuff, I just sleep just doesn't happen. So. Yeah, I uh, I've always been that way as a child. I've always had my dad is that way, so I've kind of inherited from him a little bit too. So yeah, I've always been up before everybody and. Uh, I in high school when I was a little bit more adventurous and times like when I was younger I could stay up for days and and not have to sleep so but oh just a weird thing about me that is insane I've had friends that are like that I'm like oh, gosh I have to sleep at some point like I just can't like not not sleep because I'm now, now a I, now bear. I, do that. I, I, I do one 24 hour session and I'm ready for a four hour nap so yes. my body has told me more of over time, like there, there, I will have like a designated sleep day. If I go too long, too hard, my body will just shut completely down and I will sleep the entire day. So oh, it's happened to me. So that sounds nice. <laughs> I wish I could do that. Just have a day to sleep. Oh man. So back on the books with, yeah. are you a plotter or are you a pantser? So I started as a pantser. Uh, I had that first book amongst the killing was written in basically four days. Uh, and I just went and did it. I didn't have any idea of preconceived notion of what I was doing. I didn't even have the idea of who these characters were. Like I did not have their professions or their, their monikers. I didn't 
know one was going to be a murderer and one was going to be a cop until I actually kind of went through it again. It was more, I actually just wrote like two people's two, two people's thoughts and just wrote it out like that and didn't connect the dots like that and didn't have any like uh, details or anything like that. So that's how it started for me. And I actually wanted to do it as a movie first. So I wrote, I started a screenplay and it didn't work out because I was finding I just had so much internal monologues and details and that's so hard to do on, on a screen. So I just decided, okay, well, this might be the novel I've been waiting to write. So I did that and that's how I approached it. But as, I, as I've gotten on and done movies and things like that, I've gotten more to the idea of organizing my thoughts a little bit better. So I'm kind of a planter. I will plot out. I know where I'm going and the directions I'm going. I know what characters are going to do what. I know their arcs. And uh, it does change. It does shift when I start writing sometimes. But and then it shifts again when somebody edits something and then they give me a whole different idea. Like that's what's happening right now. I'm rewriting the first book because as as you know, there was some grammatical errors and some things that I, I really didn't think about when I first put it out there. And and then it, and it also it was going to be a standalone. So it was its first. I didn't have any intention of writing a second book or a third book. It was only going to be that one book and I was going to be done with it. And then people started to like it so much and they asked me when's the next one come out and the next one come out. And then that's what happened. And then, uh, you know, my publisher, Three Furious Press, got involved and they were like, we want to make another book with you. So if you're not writing a sequel, what are you writing? And I said, well, OK, I'll write a sequel. And then we just started writing the sequel. Uh, <laughs> so all that in that respect, I've gotten to the point where I know where I'm going with it and, and how it's going to go. Uh, this third book, I, I have a better idea than I did the second book and obviously the first book. So, and I'm doing a six book fantasy series that I've written most of the first book for already. And so that series I plotted out just little blurb of, of which, what's going to happen in each book just vaguely. And now I have some ideas. And with that, you almost have to kind of plan a little bit because there's world building and all that stuff I didn't ever want to ever deal with. And now I'm dealing with it. <laughs> so all of that turned into me being more of a, a planter than anything. So and I kind of like that. I kind of like that idea, I like having the eggshell and then trying to figure out what I'm going to make inside of the egg. So. I do agree with you about it, like the planter thing because I've become more of like a little bit of planning than I used to be because my face shifter series those were kind of all like fly by the seat of your pants till I got to like book three and I was like okay where am I ending it here these characters are wanting to keep going I was like well crap okay we gotta get a little more organized here like this has got to go somewhere but that is yeah. really awesome yeah well truth be told I think everybody's kind of in the middle you know yeah. a little bit you know I, I think plotters are more apt to outliners and plotters are more apt to be outliners and plotters and not kind of go toward the middle as much but us pantsers i think we all grow into the idea that because we start to realize how you know there's something about when you write and you write more words and more words you kind of know what you're doing at that point it, it, you know you at least you hope you do you think you do and it gets easier in that respect i mean it's not very easy but it it gets a little bit easier every time. And so you, you kind of gravitate toward that just natural knowing how to make a story move and work and everything like that. So, yeah. And I loved how in this first book, like how in the head, like Vic, I was with the characters. I thought that was so fascinating that you did that. It's just like, Oh my gosh, especially with Jack Casey, holy cow. Like, his character, the way he developed from the start of the book to the end of the book, and then he's in the second book. I'm not going to say how. For those of you watching, you have to read it. But it's just, wow. I was that his brain. Holy cow. Yeah. To, yeah. to know how it was working and where he was going with it. And just to know, like, what caused it all. That I'm trying not to give too many spoilers away. <laughs> Well, I, I will say uh, the idea, the original idea was that there's two sides to every story, right? So, and, you know, we live in such a polarizing time where in that, 
you, you have if you have one opinion, you kind of stick to that one opinion. But that's not how that's not how people work. It's mm-hmm. everybody. If you if you knew that person's story and where they come from and why they are the way they are, you would have. If you're any type of good human being, you would gain or gain some kind of perspective on it. And so that's kind of how I approached it. I like that. And then you threw me for a loop when I started this one, <laughs> switching point of view on it. I was like, wait, what? Like, whoa, okay. But I have to say, I liked it from Jamie's point of view just a little bit more. Uh-huh. And it was, I guess, I think I found myself relating because she's a mom too. And just having to deal with all the stuff with her husband and everything else that's going on. I was like, yeah, yeah, I get that. It just, and hundred percent could relate to it. Even the whole having to dress the part for the whole situation, which I'm not going to spill too much into. You guys got to read the book. It's good. You're going to love it. It can be read as a standalone too, but I highly recommend reading them together. If you can find the first book right now. Woo. Anyway, sorry. I'm having like a fan moment here, guys. Just uh, no, <laughs> just my buddy, guys. So like. I just, the fact that I could sit down and actually get lost in these, because this is normally not my genre. Obviously, you see, I'm more of a fantasy, like urban fantasy kind of reader, shifters and whatnot. But these were so good. Now I'm on a crime thriller crack. So, and and a little bit of horror. So, (laughs) I don't know how it got me to that. But, yeah. So, go ahead. Let's, I'm going to edit this part out because I lost my train of thought. Fan girling there for a second. Let me get back on my topic here. Okay. The covers. With your covers, which I did not notice on, at first on this cover, if you guys can see it, the faces. I didn't notice that until after I read the book, and I thought that was really neat. Mm-hmm. What made you decide to go with that? So I actually held a contest in um, Design Crowd, I believe it was. You, you can go to Design Crowd and they give you, like, you give a budget to them, like the winning the winner gets this amount and and you hold like a contest and like I got like a bunch of entries and a lot of things and that was what came to me it originally was the two silhouettes and then there was a little bit of what you see inside of there and then we did some tweaking together I, I got with the artists themselves and did some major tweaking because there's a couple um easter eggs in there and we put those in there. And once we did that, I said, that's what I wanted. So it was like, it was like, as soon as I saw it, I said, that, that is awesome. I, that's the kind of thing. And then we kind of followed the, the theme of that uh, with the second book, having the silhouette and everything. Yeah. Like that. So, yeah. I love it. Cause it does, it gives the hints and that I, I didn't put that together till after I read the book. So I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then after I read it, I was like, Oh my gosh, how did I miss this? Like, it's insane. I like I like the idea that they blend together too because mm-hmm. that's really what what I was going for is you know your your reaction is not uncommon to to people who've read the books and talked to me about it is is like they they think one way they like the like one character at the beginning and then toward the end they kind of either they kind of get that they have similarities and blend together or that they like one over the other so it's kind of I like oh, that. <laughs> that is awesome. So did you have a favorite character in writing the books? I liked writing Janie. I liked writing her. I I didn't think I could do it. And I had a lot of help. Um, I mean, obviously, talking to indie authors and authors and, and learning more about perspectives and, and what, how, you know, how to write, because I can, I can be first and foremost to tell you, I don't know a thing about women. To, you know that I I think you know other than you know where it comes from my perspective so to to get there I really wanted to take on that challenge that was always what I thought about when I was going to do a second book that was where I wanted to go with it and I thought that Janie got kind of a raw deal in the first book with a little bit of a less perspective there so I wanted it to be outside of Chuck and Jack's perspective and so that's naturally who I gravitated toward and and so I really liked and then as I got into it and realized I could put a lot of me in her you know without it being too overtly stupid <laughs> I I uh, uh 
I, I really started to enjoy writing that character. You did a great job on her. That's for sure. Thanks. She totally, I, I loved how tomboy like she was too. Cause that's, I cannot wear heels to save my life. I've I've had to on a few occasions and then that one barefoot. So, cause I'm just like, uh, cause at least she like grinned and bared like wearing them longer periods of time. I was just, mm, I couldn't do it. That's all I could think about. So where would you say you get most of your inspiration from? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that most of it comes from, I like, I, I find like a sentence or um, a quote and, or a philosophy and I play off of that. Like, like I said, the first book, uh, it was telling the same story basically with two different perspectives. So the two sides to every story was kind of where it started for me. And I wanted to play with that and, and, and see how that went. But the second book, it was more of the philosophy of not not everything you see is what you believe. And so uh, I I kind of it's always really kind of a philosophy. The fantasy book uh, is it, the fantasy series is really about philosophy, about uh, it, generations being, you know, uh, torn apart by by the idea of them not really understanding who they are. And I, I, the fantasy books kind of come to me at a time when I was really lost because I had just gotten divorced and I was going, the last 18 months, I've been going through a lot of personal growth and, and spiritual growth. And so that's kind of, I've been kind of channeling that into the books. It's kind of helped me as my little bit of therapy, you know, obviously these, the, the crime books, no way are they therapy and no way are they anything of what I really think, but uh it's but it's just it, it's it it would start with those philosophies and i kind of decided how what characters to play around with to do that to achieve that and it could be therapeutic writing these books i mean you could kill off somebody you're, you're mad at and just <laughs> use a different name just hide yeah, it in yeah, there yeah. so yeah it, it's 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 um it's reward without consequences right so yes Yes, because I've totally put people in books and killed them off. Just, <laughs> just saying, guys. So, with everything you've got going on, what do you do to help with your self care? Uh, yeah, I think that's super important. I really do um, try and give myself time. I, I do a lot of walking and meditating. Those are the kind of things that I like to do. I like to, uh, um, like I said, I've been trying to take care of myself and. To, be a little bit more conscious of me and so so I think self-care goes along with all that so uh that's basically what I do I try to stay away from media like like reading has been really great but I try and stay away from anything that has to do with who I am and what I'm doing in that respect if I'm watching something I'm watching something from like like the 80s like an 80s comedy or something like that something that I can just forget it turn off my brain for a bit and just forget about it so that is good because those are great ways for self-care that's I find myself doing that when I really really drained I just like binge watch something on Netflix which the last thing was Witcher I told myself I wasn't gonna do it and I did it and I was just like um okay so I, I I go through weird uh, like like so I went through a scrubs phase I watched we watched yes. the entire yes. series scrubs and and Parks and Rec, and then um, now I'm into community, so I'm watching like community. But like that's the kind of thing that I, I get away from, like things that don't have anything to do with what I do. So yeah, that's the best, honestly. So I even find myself struggling. Like I, as of late, I haven't been able to read like eBooks on digital mm -hmm. stuff as well, and I've totally gone back to buying physical books and my husband is hating me right now because I have stacks of books everywhere that I'm just not getting to as fast but it's it, it's part of like how I turn myself off from everything because I'm okay. so on the computer on my phone doing social media stuff or like marketing or like working on book stuff I'm like I just gotta get away from tech like it's gotta turn it off That's way to do it. yeah it is and it's a lot of people don't even really think about it. So it's it's kind of just good to give your brain and your eyes a break from the screen. Absolutely. So you said you hate world building earlier, right? 
I, I have, so I've had this adverse reaction to fantasy for a very long time. Um, and it stems from the fact that when I was 10 years old, I picked up Dune and kind of really enjoyed the philosophy behind it, but I couldn't get past all of the descriptions and all that. And then, you know, then my dad, he's a big fantasy guy and, and my brother's a big fantasy guy. So it's always, here's Lord of the Rings. Here's Robert Jordan. Here's the... And those books just bore the crap out of me. They, I just couldn't, I couldn't get. I know that's blasphemy. I know all. No, of no, I totally get it because it was hard. It was hard to read some of those. Like I had to push myself to read like The Hobbit, and it just. I mean, it was a good book. Don't get me wrong, but it was very over the top descriptive. Yeah, I, I, I like, I like more books that are more cinematic, and so I never really found that with fantasy. Now that's changed. A lot of fantasies won me over and changed my perspective on that a lot. And the way I read now, too, just changed my perspective. But but yeah, I, for a long time, I, I just really had, I mean, I would have drag out knockout fights with plotters about, about world building. And you can go back and watch some old shows. You'll see I'm the, I'm the lone descending voice amongst all the plotters and talking to them about it. But it, it, it's it just is it was just something that I really didn't get you know and I didn't understand and now that I'm immersed in it that's why they're all excited to hear me do be doing a fantasy is because yeah. they never thought that would be possible but and I never thought that would be possible but it just happened and so I'm I mean I'm enjoying it to a certain extent but I'm also realistic about uh what I remember I don't like so I'm trying to stay away from that and repeat that in my own writing so and honestly i have to agree with you on that i think it's more of like the indie authors have found a way to break through that lull that happens mm -hmm. with all the description and uh, maybe that's partly why a lot of us don't get pulled in by the big publishers anymore is because mm -hmm. we're not like over the top descriptive and that's a common thing in all books by the big publishers is over description. You're like, yeah, I'm just going to skip. Because I've even like, because I do the book of the month box and I get books published through all the big publishers. And I'm like, I just skip paragraphs where it's like just detail. I'm like, just get to the action. Like, I don't care what his grandma looks like and is wearing and this, this holding in her hand. Like, what's, what are they talking about? What's going on? Where's the action? Like, tell me the important stuff. It's been my issue with Stephen King for a very long time. Uh, I even had a little bit of that aversion with Anne Rice, although I've been more forgivable with Anne Rice because of the subject matter. But but there's there's one book, and I don't remember which one it is. I think it's Queen of the Damned, where uh, Lestat is walking through a field of roses, and she's just talking about how his fingertips are touching the roses and the different colors of roses and the different blades of grass. I mean, literally describing every blade of grass that he walks by, and it was like... I was. I threw the book. I threw it. I literally threw it across the room and said, "No, no, I'm not. I'm not getting into this. This sucks," you know. And so I've always had that aversion to. I like story, and I think a lot of that. Why we're seeing a lot more indies and stuff do that is because movies and television have taken over our lives, and so we we think more cinematically. And I think we realize that we can tell a story in ninety minutes pretty fast and still be enthralled by it. So. Why not do the same in the books that we read? That is so true. And it, it's crazy that it's moved to that, but I, I like that it has because it's, I feel like it's a little bit easier to get lost in it. It pulls you mm -hmm. in faster. Ugh. So on top of Go Indie Now and every, all the podcasts and stuff you've got going on in the self-care, do you have hobbies that you do or like to have, do on the, like, the side or on the weekend? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I I, um, I was uh, for a while early on uh, in my marriage and uh, during um, just starting these the, the stuff up, I was I was playing softball. That's kind of something that I really like doing. Uh, I like going swimming. Uh, so I'll like I'd love like going to lakes and rivers and, and, and pools and just, just swim and just, just do that and not think about anything. I mean, I don't know if those are hobbies though. I, yeah. it's not really, I mean, I, I mean, I watch, I watch some TV, uh, I, I, like eighties movies. I really love, I can watch every single eighties movie a thousand times I have. So, and I can quote them backwards and forwards. 
uh i guess the one hobby i really do have that is like habitual now is tiktok i spend an hour on tiktok every day at least <laughs> so that's that's probably my one vice my one hobby is tiktok i don't I, i'll i'll sit i i don't know why i just get in, enraptured in it but i'll sit there and on my phone and watch three minute videos like five thousand of them before i go to bed uh you know i it's just something that i i, I gravitate towards so that's youtube too i but i don't i'm i'm starting to get away from youtube even so mm -hmm. tiktok has been it so TikTok yeah kind of replaced that for me so that's it i i uh, I work and I'm boring. I'm really boring. <laughs> <laughs> your books are not. So, I mean, that's where all your hobby stuff is going into. And really, TikTok has kind of taken over everything because I end up, I open the app and it's like 40 minutes later, I'm like, crap, what was I going to do? Like, oh, uh, I was going to post something too. I need to do that. And it's just videos. <laughs> Just keep I, know, I going. think about that all the time. Like I see ones where I can stitch or do it. I think about okay, I'm gonna do it, but then I go, but then I have to get up and do it, and then like I'm gonna do like 50 takes of it, and then you know yeah. I'm gonna pick one. So I mean, it's so it's so difficult mm -hmm. to do those things. It is. It, it's time consuming. It's easier just yeah. to like it becomes dense. it becomes doing going you know stuff uh, for me. So it's like, all right, well, I just kind of want to watch. I kind of just want to scroll that is true it's an easy way to just relax so mm -hmm. if you could give advice to a new author that's fixing to publish or is working on writing a book what advice would you give them keep writing just keep writing just write and write and write some more when you're done writing some more keep writing and just do it uh don't think about it don't don't look at how I'm going to market this. Don't look at how I'm going to edit this. I don't look at who, how much it's going to cost me. Don't look about any of that. All of that stuff will take care of itself. I mean, obviously, you know, if you don't have any money and you need to publish it and you're trying to publish it self-publishing, yeah, you want to plan that out a little bit better down the road, but you got to have something to do that with to begin with. And the, the hardest thing for young writers, I think, to do is get out of their own headspace and not do it. I think they make every reason and every excuse in the book not to do it. I mean, every time somebody comes up to me and I get this every time I'm in a person somewhere, I get at least two people come up to me and ask me, you know, oh, I have this idea for a book, you know, uh, what do you think about that? And I go, oh, it sounds good. Write it. You know, that's what I tell them. And they go, oh, well, I was hoping I could just, get no, I, I don't, I do my, I have my own thoughts. I have my own stories. I'm totally fine with those. And believe me, they take up enough of my headspace and time. I don't need anybody else's, you know, craziness inside of me. That's your craziness. Take it down and sit down and write it. Trust me, when you do it, it'll be the greatest. If you're really meant to do it, if you really like it, it'll be the greatest thing you have ever done in your life. And just keep doing it. I mean, words, you only get better the more words you do. It's it's like riding a bike, you know, it, you just keep doing it and you never forget it. So even if you go through droughts, if you go through spirit at times when you're not writing, you don't feel like writing, that's okay too. Forgive yourself, let it go. Because once you pick it back up, I guarantee you, it's like riding the bike, you'll get right back on it and you'll be right where you left off, maybe even a better place because you were thinking about other things. So it, 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 I just say, just keep going. And, and the editing and all that will take care of itself once it's done. That's a great, that's great advice. Cause that's true. I, that was, I struggled with that when I first published was just getting out of that headspace and just like, you know, what? just going for it. We're going to do it. Here's hitting the button. Uh, now I learned a lot from doing it because I did not plan it out worth crap, but that's great advice guys. And you, I, I highly recommend that advice. So go ahead and tell our viewers where they can find you and your work. Sure. Um, Monks the Killing, uh, I think you can only get in paperback right now because uh, we took it down because we're redoing re it at the moment. So uh, you might want to wait for that. I don't know. It's up to you. I mean, you reading it the first time is not going to hurt you. Reading it the second time, you'll probably get a lot more out of it because it, what, we, what we've done a lot with the first one is connected to the second one and the third one a lot better. So there's extra scenes that weren't in the first one that you'll get if you get it twice. So, and I don't have a problem getting it twice. Um, but Amongst the Killing and We the Moral Majority, We the Moral Majority is on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. You can get it there. Um, and you can pretty much 
uh, get amongst the killing. I think you can get at Barnes and Noble too. I think it's wide. So, um, but uh, uh, myself uh, on Twitter is Joe Dreams Seventy Three. Going now is everywhere that I am. So uh, on TikTok, I'm going now. On Instagram, going now. Facebook, going now. I mean, you can friend me personally, Joe Compton. I don't have a problem with friending people and talking to people. Uh, that doesn't bother me. Um, as long as you're not a bot. If you're a bot, I don't, I don't, won't accept your friend request. But if you're a person, I don't, I don't, I don't deny you of access to me. That's just, I find that silly. So that's, yeah. I mean, going now is youtube.com slash going now. That's where you can see uh, Miss Madeline do her thing all the time there. So, uh, which we're very happy that she's part of our family. So, uh, but yeah, it's great. And uh, that's where you can find me. So. All right, guys. And I'm going to hold those books up again and make sure you guys check out some of the going now like chats on Sundays and Joe's car. Like they're all, he's got some great stuff on YouTube. All right, Joe. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun.